Every generation has events that shape who they are. The greatest generation defeated fascism in World War II. The silent generation was defined by ambiguity in the Forgotten War. Baby boomers had Woodstock, and Generation Xers had the introduction of personal technology. But it is the millennials who could be the next great generation. Join 11 Penn State students as they discover what it means to be this generation. We are the millennials. Well, here we are, guys. We are the millennials. We've all been going around doing research on our generation. What do you have for me? You know, a lot of people are saying that we're the hardest working and most independent generation. Yeah, we're so busy. I think our generation is starting to bring the business world into their social lives. I think it's also important uh, that the reason we're able to do that is because of the advances in technology. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we're able to communicate with people across the world instantly, and that helps both in our business and interpersonal lives. You have programs like Instant Messengers, you know, Yahoo, AIM, all those things, and cell phones that allow you to do that. So it seems like interpersonal communication is what really is a big factor of the millennial generation. There is no question when it comes to millennials and their adaptability to rising new technologies. With the advent of the internet, millennials have shaped a world where they will always be in contact with one another. But what technologies are they using to better interpersonal communications? Well, I think more people are using IM and chat, and so people are in contact more frequently. Facebook's like taking over the internet. Everyone has a Facebook. It's how you communicate with people, and it's great for staying in contact with people. Texting is very convenient because I could be on the entire west end of campus when my friends could be on the east end. The technology enables us to like find a mutual meeting place when we're so far away. But how has the digital age affected the millennial generation? Well, the average millennial is spending 17 hours a week connected to the internet. Some people are wary that we've become a generation that's accustomed to instant gratification. Well, it's definitely a negative. I mean, if you look, kids are walking around texting. You see people at dinner with their families texting. Like, they don't know. It's kind of a rude thing. You hang out with someone, they're texting someone else. It's like they're, they're, they're always open to, they can't really shut themselves off. Like I'll call my friends and a lot of times they'll get annoyed because I like prefer to call as opposed to text. And I'll call someone and it'll be very annoying because in response I get a text message instead. And I think like our millennial society is relying too much on like technology as a means of communication. As other previous generations have relied on letters and land phones during long distance relationships, Millennials are accustomed to using multiple technologies on their cell phones and computer. This is my boyfriend, Doug. And this is my girlfriend, Christina. And we are and millennials. We are millennial. Well, we started using webcams freshman year, which was the first time that we were apart because we were together in high school and then we went off to college to different, different universities and we wanted to find a way that we could still stay connected somehow. Webcams don't necessarily make or break a relationship but it certainly makes it a lot easier on both ends. Just the fact that we're able to see each other visually instead of just hearing each other, it really you know, adds that extra element to the relationship where that really helps us to stay together. With the rise of webcam programs Skype and iChat, the long distance relationship is evolving faster than ever. Well, if I were home, I prefer to Skype. It's, uh, it costs nothing to Skype, so that's nice. You don't have to worry about getting a phone bill or using up all your texts. The only time I would choose anything else, like text or phone over Skype, is if I wasn't in my room, I think. I know a lot of couples who tried to stay together in college or, or decided to stay together, but then were not able to do it for one reason or another. I think Christina and I are kind of the exception that we're still together. We're both seniors and we we're able to, to make it work. And I think if you really put in that extra effort to try to find ways to make it work, whether it be using a webcam or deciding that you're always going to talk at least once a day or you know, really regimenting yourself to, to make sure that you're constantly staying involved with each other in, in each other's lives. Th those are the couples that, that really make it, the ones that are both on the same page and they both are trying to make it work. So, uh, you and Christina still going strong? I'm happy to say we are going strong. You know, technology really made it a lot easier. Yeah, I spent the summer on the other side of the country, and if it wasn't for my cell phone, I wouldn't really have any contact with my girlfriend, so I'm thankful for that. Did you have, like, the picture messaging? 
Uh, we didn't have a signal in the park, but occasionally I could get a few texts through. Okay. Speaking of technology and girls, I sent uh, a girl a text a few weeks ago asking her on a date, and it worked. Classy. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up on We Are the Millennials, we explore the evolution of teaching and discuss the future of the millennial generation. Did you know that 71% of millennials are video gamers? with 15% of those playing over 10 hours a week. So guys, video games. How often do you or your friends play? I play at least once a day, but I know kids who play all the time, but I'm considered normal. Once a day is normal. I mean, if you're normal, I'm probably <laughs> abnormal then, because I don't really play that much. Uh, I just don't have time, but like, like you said, my friends, my roommates, they play constantly, constantly. Yeah, I have a lot of gaming systems. I have a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, a uh, Nintendo 64, a PlayStation 2, a PlayStation 3, a Game Boy. Wow. But I just don't have time to play while I'm in college. You know, I play in the summer and it breaks, but during the school year, I just don't have much time. I think it's important to see how that's, you know, video gaming has become like part of our daily lives and so ingrained mm -hmm. into what we do. Yeah, it's normal. Video gaming is quickly becoming a nationwide pastime ever since the introduction of home video gaming back in 1972. You may even say it's taken on a life of its own with millennials at the forefront. But are millennials too into gaming? It's fun, man. I think once you start playing, you get into it, like it's, it's just hard to stop. I'm definitely addicted to Guitar Hero. Um, I also like Dance Dance Revolution. Gaming has taken the millennial generation by storm and has become integral to our culture. With the advent of online play, the video game industry became a multi-billion dollar behemoth. Video game market sales reached more than 20 billion worldwide in 2006 alone. But before we can understand where gaming is now, let's take a quick look at how it's infiltrated every millennial and a lot of their parents' lives. Home video gaming hits households in 1972 with the Odyssey. Creator Ralph Baer is deemed the father of video games. In 1975, the industry took off with the game Pong, released by Atari, who went on to create the first multi-game system in 1977. In 1980, Japan's Pac-Man hits the United States, the first game to have an animated main character. Then, Nintendo. Shigeru Miyamoto created Donkey Kong in 1981. This is the first sighting of everybody's friend, Mario. Current cell phone favorite Tetris comes out in its original form in 1985. In 1986, the original NES is released nationally. Game sales reach a record high. 22 years and hundreds of billion dollars later, video gaming is connecting millennials internationally. Hanging out with the guys and playing video games isn't just a macho thing to do anymore. Believe it or not, 43% of all game players are women. In fact, women over the age of 18 represent a greater portion of the game playing population than males younger than 18. Um, I do consider myself a gamer. In my free time, if I'm not with my friends, I spend most of it playing World of Warcraft. I am not really sure why girls think it's weird to play video games. I think maybe sometimes they just don't realize that there are different types of video games and they think that they're all basically just the same thing. I mean, when I started playing video games when I was little, I just started playing video games because I thought it was fun. I didn't realize until later that this was sort of a weird thing for girls to be doing. Educators even agree that while video gaming might be addictive, there are some positives to it. A highly interactive video game can build community, it can build a sense of agency in, in people. They can, uh, they can learn to role play. They can learn to collaborate with others. So it can, it can be very good for psychological development, for personality development, for cognitive development, for focusing and things like that. It's safe to say that gaming is not just a fad, nor even an addiction. It's even been integrated into our educations. You could only imagine what obstacles video gaming tackles next. Hi, I'm Mac McAlpin, a millennial, and this is an experiment. All right, Mac, here's the deal. Technology Fast is gonna last 48 hours. No TV, no cell phone, no computers. We're gonna be doing this old school, the way they did it in the past. Anything that came out after Joe Paterno was born, you can't do it. All right, they go every day, hours and hours every day without using technology. So how can I, so 48 hours, I can do it. Them up. All right, Got get cell game, phone. game controllers. Game controllers, toss them in. And a cell phone. Cell phone. Cell phone. Peace. A TV, TV remote. TV remote. Drop it in. Computer. See ya. Usually at this time, I'd be 
on the internet, watching TV. Uh, I guess I'll just go to bed. What's going on? Not so great, not so great. I, uh, my alarm's on my cell phone. I uh, definitely woke up late for my class, about 10 minutes, had to run, and then I uh, missed a meeting with my advisor. <sighs> Takes on as one's own. See, it's six letters, O-P-T. Adopts. All right, it's the, uh, and at day two of my techno fast, the last day, uh, really excited about getting my uh, electronics back tomorrow, especially my cell phone. All right, good night. 48 hours and how many crossword puzzles later? I think of it about four. You survived the technology fast. Barely, barely. What are your What are your final opinions? Uh, you know, it's eye opening. It really is. I really struggled. I tried to cheat a few times. Got caught. Let's see, what do you want first? Um, Make it like a goodie bag. Let's do the controllers. You got video game Xbox controllers. controllers. We can go play some Halo later. Word. Alright. Your uh, laptop. This. Check your email. You it's might gonna be nice. Some, yeah, I might have to do have some, some important things in there. Do some stuff. Your TV remote. Mmm. You can watch the Phillies now. I can't go five minutes without my laptop, much less a couple of days. Yeah, I don't know how that yeah. guy did it. I mean, good for him, but. Wow, you know? Yeah, I couldn't go out on my cell phone for probably two minutes. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing how he did it. It's very hard to not rely on technology all day nowadays. Does anyone else feel that there's an ongoing uh, evolution of learning? I mean, I haven't seen a teacher use a blackboard in like four years. It's whiteboards, projectors. This is in our parents' classroom. Yeah, like nowadays, a lot of professors use PowerPoint presentations and images from the internet. And I've even seen teachers use YouTube for examples in class. Mm -hmm. Taking that a step further, uh, I have a finance and accounting class that is supposed to meet Tuesday, Thursday. And instead of meeting on Tuesdays, we watch podcasts and vodcasts online. And then we meet Thursday to discuss. Well, each semester also, like there's like more and more online classes. So it's like you don't even meet teachers. You just see a picture of them online and then you just do everything on your own time. Just have a deadline. So I feel like it's evolving fast where you don't even have to go to class anymore. As time flies by, technology is aiding millennials to learn like never before. We've come a long way since like the days of like using the chalkboard and like, you know, simple PowerPoints and it's like, you know, the internet is now so easily accessible to like to be used as a teaching method. Reaching the kids is a lot harder now than it is uh, when my parents were in school, especially being that we have so much technology available to us. I don't think it was as easy for my parents uh, to access as much information as I can. So much easier. I feel bad for my parents. <laughs> Steve Manuel is a professor who's adapting the teaching styles of his generation, catering to the millennials' need for Classroom 2.0. These classrooms with the, the AV centers, I can go to the I can go to the internet live in you know in the classroom and show them breaking news and things that's things that are going on. I use a lot of uh, videotape and you know it, didn't, it used to be all VCRs and things like that. Now I'm digitizing things and putting them on DVDs and, and jump drives and things like that. Teaching workshops are being utilized to help teachers integrate emerging technologies in the classroom. Students are also invited to attend these workshops to give feedback from the learner's perspective. And to feel like the writing has gone public. I've been getting a lot of requests from teachers about how to use technology and how to connect with their students and how to engage them in their assignments. Facebook can be used for a variety of different, you know, class management programs instead of, let's say, we use Angel or Black board at another university or some of, of those other online course management systems. I just started to uh, work with a colleague of mine um, on using Facebook uh, to actually practice French. In the French classroom, it's kind of nice that they, they are able to communicate in an informal way and that doesn't really happen in the classroom that often. It's like, it's like expanding the classroom beyond the classroom walls and that's, and that's Fantastic. What does Classroom 2.0 have in store for the millennials? 
Kolkan Police foresees a very technologically connected classroom. I think down the line what we're going to see is the, is the ability to create what I'll call personal learning environments. Okay, where not only will you have access to the materials that you have in the classroom, but you'll be able to easily, within one environment, online or whatever comes next, uh, mash that up with your own materials, materials from other institutions, open content, um, blogs, wiki content, podcast, video from YouTube, things that you've produced or that you're consuming from others. Frankly, here at Penn State, if you think about the fact that right now, faculty use a handful of tools in the classroom. They use PowerPoint. Right? They, they, use, they use ANGEL, our course management system. But the number three tool used in the classrooms for teaching purposes is YouTube. And that's really pretty stunning. So I think fundamentally what we're seeing right now in higher ed and in K-12 is that faculty and teachers alike are rethinking the role of technology. They're going beyond sort of the death by PowerPoint kinds of activities that we've seen really in the last five years and really starting to say to kids, okay, it's your opportunity. This is what you want to do. Instead of writing that 50-page that uh, report why don't you and a group of your students go out and produce a video to demonstrate knowledge? And we're seeing more and more of that across the board. So could these evolving technologies turn the millennial generation into the YouTube, 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 YouTube. generation? Nitney Booking is a concert promotion company that I started in the summer of 2006 to try to bring national bands and touring bands to State College. They come through me with their booking agent and we do it pretty much 100% online. It's definitely an advantage to work my own schedule and have my own hours over the fact that a lot of my friends are kind of, you know, like working at restaurants or waiting tables. I feel that Nitney Booking has really kind of given me that real world experience that is really valuable when you're trying to interview for jobs and try to figure out what you want to do after college. I've definitely learned more from it than I've ever learned in the classroom. My name is Garrett Bogdan and I'm a millennial. Just like every generation, millennials are unique. For the most part, we're goal oriented, practical, and we're strong multitaskers. We're also constantly connected and we're technologically savvy. Millennials are used to this way of living, and in college, for example, we're comfortable because we know that everyone around us has these same values. But what happens then when we're done here and we enter the real world? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding amongst the generations. They depend on the technology and they depend on their parents and their friends and therefore they're less resourceful in a lot of ways, or they're perceived as being less resourceful. If you don't have to memorize something and you can rely on calling somebody or Googling it all the time, you tend not to learn it as deeply and really develop a, as full an understanding of it. One of my clients shared an example with me. They had a meeting where the CEO was presenting some business results to the employees in the company, and several of their millennials were they noticed were texting during his presentation, and they were really upset by it. They saw it as um, disrespectful, as distracting. Students have a lot of learning to do. They find that being a student is very different than being an employee. I think a lot of it comes down to the type of work that they're given to do. They really want to do work that they feel is meaningful work, that they feel they're contributing to the company, and a lot of times the type of work that's given to new employees, new young employees, is more what they would consider more menial or grunt work, and that's not really what they're interested in. Despite these issues, companies still want us. In fact, some companies are actually changing the way they do things specifically to cater to our needs. Right now, millennials represent about 15% of the workforce. In the next three years, that number will more than double. And so there'll be even more millennials in the workplace and uh, companies are really gonna have to change and step up to, to meet the, the needs and the expectations of, of that generation. A lot of the big companies have created task forces to just to interact with millennials and to find out, you know, what do we need to do to work more effectively? I think that the millennial generation is probably more ready for the real world than the real world is ready for them. If anything, I think they'd have more of a problem adapting to our generation because we grew up with all the technology and all that kind of stuff. So I think it kind of gives us the upper hand. 
I'm completely okay with going in there and having the difference because I think um, you'll be able to make it work. I'm ready. Um, whatever you know, whatever the future brings, I'm ready. So there's a lot of information in there, but I, I really want to know, what do you guys think? Are we ready? Are we really ready for the real world? No, because we are used to this routine of just like waking up, going to school, coming back, not a lot of responsibilities. And once you go into the real world, there's a complete change. Yeah, but what we've seen though is that the millennial generation is an adaptable generation. They've embraced technology. They embrace new teaching methods. I think they can embrace the, the working world. Yeah, millennials are ready to work, I feel, and the world is set up for us, and all we have to do is just take advantage of it. I think they're ready to do that. I think we look good on paper, but I think there's a lot more for millennials to learn. All right, so we can go back and forth all day, but we really are not gonna know until we actually jump in into the real world and do it. So, you know, we just have to hope for the best and see what happens, right? Yeah. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.